is this? I'm Anderson. Call me. It is true. I think we all have at one time or another had that very strange and curious sensation. Whether it be a physical phenomenon of feeling or seeing or in some cases hearing and maybe even all three the fact that there's something there just off stage just out of sight in the shadows. Shadow people. The fact of the matter is, across the world, across anthropological borders, in all cultures, there is a phenomenon that has been around for a long time, known as, today, the shadow people. But what are they? What is it? Is it real? Is it not? Is it somewhere in between the two? There's an article dated September 20th, 2006, called, Illuminating the Shadow People. The article begins by stating, You're walking down an empty street alone when suddenly you have the eerie feeling that someone is following you. Is your mind simply playing tricks on you? Well, in this case, the article states, maybe so. According to a new study, when a specific region of the brain called the TPJ is stimulated, it can indeed create the illusion of a shadow person. Given that such experiences are often heightened in psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia and paranoia, and even in those who believe they've been abducted by aliens, the results, the writer states, could lead to a better understanding of these neurological conditions. The findings actually emerged by accident. Neurologist Olaf Blanke of the Brain Mind Institute of Lausanne, Switzerland, and his colleagues were attempting to identify the source of epileptic seizures in a 23-year-old woman. They applied a mild current through surgically implanted electrodes to various regions of her brain. Not much happened until the researchers actually stimulated the woman's left TPJ, the region right above the left ear, located roughly right in that area. Suddenly, she reported feeling the presence of a mystery person behind her, a motionless and speechless shadow that imitated her body posture and actions. She actually said he lay beneath her when she lay down, sat behind her when she sat down, and actually attempted to take a test card from her when she tried to participate in a language exercise. Such delusions are similar to those seen in patients with schizophrenia, says Blanque, of the Brain Mind Institute. But was it a delusion? And how did he know that? 
What strikes me is that immediately the assumption is that it is indeed an illusion, a figment of her imagination being conjured simply by the electrical stimulus. In other words, there was nothing there except what they had placed there. But how did they know that? Were they able to scientifically test that or prove that? Is it possible that what they created was an electrical, biochemical, metaphysical gateway? A stargate, so to say. Only rather than opening the door to outer space, or extra-dimensional space, or ultra-dimensional space, it actually opened up a doorway to inner space. How did they know that there was not something actually there? Schizophrenics often make mistakes, the article goes on to say. They also often make mistakes, thinking that their own bodies are someone else's, for example, and attribute their own actions to others. They also have frequent illusions of being followed or controlled by a stranger, as do those who claim to have been manipulated by aliens. But again, we have to ask the question, how do we know that these are illusions, delusions? How do we know? Blanquet says the shadow person phenomenon may shed light on how the brain perceives self. In order to recognize its own body, he says, the brain uses sensory information, such as visual and uh, cognitive cues, which indicate the position of body parts relative to each other and everything else. The TPJ, remember, right above the left ear, the TPJ is known to put some of these cues together to sort of manage all of these electrical functions that are taking place. When this function is disrupted, the brain perceives two bodies instead of one and mistakes the second for that of a stranger. It's a valid idea, says neurologist Pawan Sinha of the MIT Technical Institute of Technology in Boston. But this might be just one of the many mechanisms that generate such hallucinations, he says. But the term hallucination is a very vague term, I think, to deal in scientific realm. And being able to stimulate the brain does not necessarily account for their being able to produce a second present self. And one of the things I found very fascinating about this second self in the medical test that we spoke of earlier, is that it was not just present, but it acted independently. It acted independently. Remember, when the subject, when the subject was stimulated at the TPJ with a mild current, apparently the subject reported feeling the presence of a mystery person, a speechless shadow that imitated her body posture. Okay lay down beneath her when she lay down, okay, sat behind her when she sat down. That's spatial, I get that. But wait a second. Attempted to take a test card from her when she tried to participate in a language exercise. That was not what she was doing. Whatever she was feeling, seeing, sensing, or believing to be there, it was not a shadow created by a stimulus. It was trying to take something from her. That shadow was acting independently of her. Was it a hallucination? Hallucination is a very vague term. The question is, are people actually seeing something? Does a mental illness exclude the fact that something is there? Or are we actually seeing, rather, that a mental illness may be more a mental difference in the way that the mind is perceiving reality. Remember, reality as we know it, those of us that are Bible believers, is at least a twofold concept. In Genesis 1, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God is spirit, John 4, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There is a natural body, 1 Corinthians says, there is a spiritual body. But when God established this time-space continuum that you and I operate in now, it was heaven and earth, spirit, dimension, different than ours, and earth, the physical dimension in which we live. Is it simply that 
they are mentally ill and it's just broken? Or does their brokenness allow them to see, to experience, to feel, and to sense something more than you or I? September 25th, 2016, Anthony Justice wrote, Shadow People, what are they? Different authors and people in the paranormal have their theories as to what a shadow person is, and these ideas come from all fields of study and belief, ranging from metaphysics, religious, parapsychology, cryptozoology, and even occultism and demonology. Others have ideas that shadow people are thought forms, and I find this particular approach of Anthony's very, very interesting. The idea that shadow people are thought forms. They are the expression, the essence, the validation of the power of thought. A thought form, he writes, by the way, as most people are familiar with, the basic ideas of what a ghost and demon may be, is a manifestation of mental energy from a thinker or a person into a semi-corporal, semi-physical form. This semi-physical form, composed primarily of mental energy and of thought and of power, what we call them tulpas. Tulpas, alternatively called shadow people. And the idea for them comes actually from Tibetan and Hindu mysticism. Now, tulpas are not new to those of you that have been following the soul trap for some time. I want to digress here for just a minute and note a very interesting article that I came across not long ago called The Internet's Newest Subculture is All About Creating Imaginary Friends. Welcome to the World of Tulpamancy. An article written by Nathan Thomas at vicenews.com. And what is amazing is, is that there is a growing substrata of young men and women who are creating tulpas, interacting with tulpas, befriending tulpas, and actually experiencing intimacy and sexual encounters with tulpas. You'll see on the screen, if you're watching online, pictures of these tulpas. They are fascinating. Some are beautiful. Most are macabre and disturbing. And others... Well, others are just downright frightening. They are all pictures, drawings, sketches, expressions of tulpas. Tulpas that these young men and these young women around the world believe that they are calling into existence. The pictures of these tulpas are only the surface the surface of a world that is fast exploding on the internet. And I'm not just talking about the darker regions, the dark web or the deep web. I'm talking about mainstream internet experiences of young men and women believing with all of their heart that they are creating a being or giving birth to a being or bringing into fruition a being known as a tulpa. Anthony Justice goes on, To state in his article, further speaking of the tulpas, there is a book called Thought Forms by Annie Besant and C.W. Ledbetter, which is essentially a study on the power of the nature of thoughts. They say as their premise that thoughts have two effects on the physical world, a radiating vibration. Now that's a fascinating statement to me, a radiating vibration. A radiating vibration immediately causes me to go back to the book of Genesis, chapter number one. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. Words, sound, are vibration. And we can tie that in with the string theory and the string, the theory of vibration that is going around today in some circles of quantum physics. But then you have radiating, light. God is light. Jesus is word. I wonder sometimes the connectivity that is taking place. God said, and it was. In other words, they state as their premise that thoughts have two effects on the physical world, a radiating vibration and a floating form. 
Watch now. These are not Christians in any stretch of the imagination. But as always at the, at the soul trap, we are connecting dots. And you have to wonder, radiating vibration and a floating form. In the beginning, God said, there's your vibrating. Let there be light. There's your radiating. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There's your floating form. The article states, radiating vibration, floating form, going further, they break up their classification of thought forms into several different categories. The first is called thought forms that take the image of the thinker. Sound familiar? The first form of thought is a thought form that takes the image of the thinker. And God said, let us make man in our... You got it. The second thought form is called thought forms that take the image of a material object. The third thought form are called thought forms which take the form of a unique entity all its own, expressing its inherence and its qualities in the matter which draws around it. The book also examines the effects of music, emotion, and colors in regards to thought forms as well. Music, emotion, color. I often think now about Genesis chapter number three, that Hebrew word, the serpent was more subtle, a Hebrew word denoting musical terminology there, emotion and color. Have you ever seen a more beautifully colored animal than some of the snakes? I know that we may be reaching for some of the dots, but you have to wonder, at what point do you have so many dots that you can't help but connect them? Some people feel that the shadow people are creatures from another plane of existence, Anthony writes, that simply overlaps our own. That may be very true. Oddly, others believe that shadow people are two-dimensional entities that reside or pass through our three-dimensional reality and are somehow tied in to gray aliens. Remember, at any given time, there may be more than just your own thought forms in a given area, if that theory holds true. Tulpas may be present during poltergeist outbreaks when people believe they are seeing demonic forms and monstrous creatures. If a thought form takes the form of your thoughts and you're angry, distressed, or worried, one must consider what would anger look like given a form, or fear, or passion. I can almost bet, the writer states, it wouldn't be pretty. Again, there may be more of a connection than either side wants to recognize. Maybe the balance is not either or, but both and. Maybe science and the parasciences are tapping into a reality that is both mystical and mechanical, that is both spiritual and earthbound, that is both a physical body and a spiritual body. Many different scientific principles can explain the effects experienced during shadow people encounters, including hallucinations and optical illusions brought on by different physiological or even psychological conditions, drug use, and or the interaction of external agents on the human body, the writer states. Also, images seen in the peripheral area, the edge of vision, can be caused by what is termed uh, peridolia, which means, in simple terms, when your brain incorrectly interprets complex lines, colors, lights, or shadow, or even texture, it appears to be something familiar. The common term used by us and the majority of other researchers was coined by Grant Wilson called matrixing. It simply means your mind, your brain, and your eyes all work to try to create something that is rational to you doesn't have all the information, so it sort of fills in the gaps. What are people seeing? Shadow people. What are they? Where do they come from? Are they real? Are they figments of an imagination? Are they visitors from another time, another place? Or simply conjured specters from a misfiring brain? Thomas Byers writes about these shadow people. He states, let me ask you, 
while you're setting, watching TV or reading, have you ever thought you caught movement out of the corner of your eye when you knew for a fact that no one could possibly be there? Or have you been lying in bed and you could have just sworn that there was a dark shape of a shadow there in the room with you? Well, you just may have seen a shadow person, Byers writes, because more and more people are seeing shadow people. And when he says more and more people, the numbers are growing at an exponential rate. It would be easy to discount this phenomenon if it was located in a particular region, but it is a global phenomenon. He writes, shadow people and my mom's ghost. In the place where I now live, I see shadow people all the time. They walk in through the back door and go right back out through the laundry room and right back outside. Several hundred yards from here is where I saw one of the most distinctive shadow persons that I have ever seen. In the home I live in, there is a section of that home that I don't use. And I see shadow people in the bathroom back there all the time. Sometimes it appears to be looking at itself in the bathroom mirror. And it can be really spooky to walk back there in the middle of the night and see it. But as soon as I see it, it vanishes almost at once out of sight. His story is not an anomalous story. The stories like these, as I stated earlier, are picking up globally. Why? Why is it happening now? Is it because it has been somehow injected into the flowing stream of Western conscious mind? Is it some Jungian uh, cultural phenomenon that has entered into our group think? Is it because some people are simply looking for their 15 minutes of fame? Or is there an uptick? Or maybe a better way to say it would be an in-tick. Is there something happening to us and in us that is allowing us to view into the shadowy regions of the other world? Is there a collision of supra-intense sexuality, intense uber-violence, stress, overstimulation, drugs, chemical imbalances, is there something that is happening to us more so than we have ever had before that is allowing us to view ever so briefly into the other side? Recently, my mother shared with me what she calls a shadow voice. My mother lives in North Carolina by herself, the beautiful region just north of Charlotte, a Christian woman. A God-fearing woman loves the Lord, and much of all that I am, I owe to her. She is not your typical uh, spooky, sensational uh, kind of a person. She listens to the soul trap merely because she loves her son, not because she would be considered a believer in the soul trap material. But one night, she shared with me an event that has stayed with her. And maybe a better word would be haunted her. One night, my mother saw something. Well, didn't see something. It was not a movement of shadow. It was a movement of sound. In the evening, later in the evening, around 9, 9.30, she was preparing for bed. She works as a paralegal attorney and spends long hours at the office, and so... She was preparing her lunch and getting things ready for the following day. The news was off. The lights were low. The house was quiet. She finished packing her lunch and put it in the refrigerator, turned the lights off in the kitchen, and walked across the living room, headed to the other side of the house where the bedrooms were, when distinctly, loudly but not violently, she heard her name called. Diane. Not angry, 
not violent, not in some weird, mechanical, or macabre voice, but simply a man from the kitchen calling her name, Diane. It was so real and so clear to her that she told me her first response was to actually respond. What? It was as if a son, a friend, a familiar, we'll call it, a familiar voice had called to her from her kitchen. Immediately, living alone as she did, she totally freaked, and who wouldn't? She rushed to her bedroom and drew her pistol from the nightstand and began scouring the house. She was left dazed and confused because there was no one there. Every light was on in the house. Every door was locked. Every window sealed. She's not a spooky person. But she was convinced. There was a clear voice coming from the kitchen just moments ago. Of course, I queried her. Maybe you thought it was me. Maybe you had me on your mind. Maybe you had my brother on your mind. Maybe you were thinking about, no, no, she heard it. It was there. It was maybe not in the technical, visible shadows, but it was in the shadow of sound, the shadow of reality, a vague uneasiness settled in over her. She was not alone. What are these people? Are these people beings? Are they people? Things swirling around us in the expanse of the unknown? What are the shadow people? It's a very interesting concept. There are a myriad of images that people have tried to convey of their experiences and their visitation of the shadow people. Some are hooded, darkened. Some wear a hat. Some are freakishly looking beings. Some with red eyes. Some are terrifying. Some are alien-like in their specter and in their display. Some come to children in their sleep and in their bed. Some are fiendish and cannibal-like. Some creep across the walls like the tentacles of an octopus, but they all come at night. And what are the shadow people? One author puts it this way, I truly believe that shadow people are spirits that are stuck here on earth. And like any other spirits, we can try to talk with the shadow people we see or encourage them to move on. But maybe, just maybe, for one reason or another, shadow people can't move on. For some reason we may never know, they are stuck here on earth forever. A lot of people who have seen and experienced shadow people don't think that the shadow people are residual hauntings. Most people who have seen the shadow people think that the shadow people are intelligent and able to come and go when they want. Some people even say they think that shadow people may be another life form entirely. The writer states, I, however, believe that shadow people were once living, breathing human beings, which, as I digress here, may be the reason why that demons, as Pember mentioned, want to inhabit the human body. It is possible that these shadow people have been walking around for a very, very long time. And by very long time, you'll have to read Pember, but I mean a long time, somewhere between Genesis 1-1 in Genesis 1-2. Then again, there are many people that see shadow people for just a second out of the corner of their eye, and they tell themselves that they are seeing things or they saw nothing. However, some people tell of seeing shadow people wearing coats and hats. A few people have even, as mentioned earlier, claimed to see shadow people with bright red glowing eyes, which immediately reminds us of the Mothman. While most shadow people are only seen for a few brief seconds, some are seen for a longer period of time and have several, uh, some have seen them several times in a row. They've seen them move around the room or plastered upon the ceiling. The experiences vary. Uh, 
The author says, you see, I know for a fact that shadow people are very real and they do exist. What I don't know is exactly what is a shadow person. What makes them appear different from a ghost? Some people have even said they think shadow people are extraterrestrial in nature. I, however, he states, do not. I think there were once living, breathing human beings who are now trapped here on earth. Forever doomed to roam about the place or places where they lived when they were alive. What I wonder is, why do some ghosts appear looking like they did when they were living, breathing human beings, and other spirits of deceased persons appear as shadow people? What makes a spirit appear as a shadow person while other spirits trapped on earth appear looking like the person they were when they were alive? All valid and good questions. The problem is we may never know what a shadow person is. We may never fully understand the shadow person experience, but rest assured, if you have ever seen one, you will never forget it. So for the most part, and in the main, there is little that one can do now other than catalog the phenomenon and watch it go by, and sometimes even kind of smirk and smile at the few crazies who claim to have seen it. You can laugh it off and find it mere entertainment and something to listen to while you're driving and passing the time. That is until the first time you see one. When you are up on that particular night, for some reason, a bit restless, a bit fidgety, the lights are low, and you make your foray, foray into the kitchen at midnight, maybe a little after, there to get a snack, a glass of milk. And there you see it, him, what? You see, but you don't see. You hear, but you don't hear. Across the room, in the recesses of your vision, it stands, it lurks, leering, lashing itself to your mind now against the reality of what you thought once was. There in the dark, you see for the first time the dark men, the shadowers. And then you are a believer, or at least a seer. Give you my pretty and your soul. Ooh. Ah! <laughs>